In Family Guy, Meg is constantly told how ugly she is. In fact, it's a reminder that she gets every single day. Meg ugly. She's apparently so ugly that even the blind can tell. Ugh, gross. Despite this though, she has had a surprisingly high number of boyfriends. Granted, a couple of them were dead and a few of them were gay, but hey, at least she's gotten married. Even if it was just for a green card. So yeah, Meg really hasn't had the best luck with men, or even dogs, but what I like about her is her persistence. Sure, some of those guys could have stolen her organs and made out with her mum, but these setbacks never stopped her from looking for true love. Because let's face it, punching bags deserve love too. So in this video, I'm going to go through all of Meg's love interests in the show and see who had the best potential and which one straight up sucked. Oh yeah, and very quickly, me and the lovely guys at GamerSub have teamed up together to give away a free hamper full of goodies simply as a thank you to my community. So if you'd like to win it, simply comment down below who your favourite Family Guy character is, followed by hashtag GG. I will pick someone at random in one week to win it, and in the meantime, you can use my code CARTOON for 10% off all products from their website. Personally, I can't recommend their products enough. I genuinely use their caffeine drinks when I'm up all night writing, editing and recording because it's far healthier than having sugar-loaded energy drinks. My favourite flavours are cherry and their mango meta. They taste really, really great and have absolutely no sugar. But if you're a bit unsure on what flavour to get and commit to it, then I'd really recommend getting one of their cups, which comes with a few sample flavours. And speaking of their cups, look how cute these waifu ones are. So, simply click my link down below in the description for 10% off, and also thank you so much to GamersUp for sponsoring my channel. So before Meg was the show's butt monkey, and way before she was a serial killer, season 1 Meg was just an ordinary teenage girl. An average teen that had crushes like anyone else, her first being her new next door neighbour. Yep, in Family Guy's fifth episode entitled A Hero Next Door, the Swansons move to Spooner Street, and Meg falls in love with their son Kevin. Oh, he's gay. You wish. Get out of here, you mouth breather. So later on, as Meg and Kevin are watching a hostage situation, she tries striking up a conversation with him. And when that falls flat, a nearby police officer says that she should simply try just talking about him instead. Do you like music? Oh yeah, I played guitar in a band before we moved, but uh, it interfered with my studies. And although the episode does end there, this show will continue this blossoming romance in season 2's Da Boom. In it, Kevin asks Meg out for Quagmire's New Year's Eve party, and she's super psyched. That was until Peter made his entire family hide in a bomb shelter. And I could be getting felt up by Kevin. Now Meg, don't you give it all away up front. Make him work for it. Which turns out to be a good thing, because all of a sudden, Quahog is obliterated by a nuclear bomb. I finally get a date with Kevin, and he gets vaporized! Luckily, this was all simply part of Pam Ewing's dream. You know, that lady from Dallas. A little random, but that's Family Guy for you. After this episode, however, the writers did drop this romance. The only other mention we did get was in season 3 when the family read Meg's diary. Today, he was out in the yard raking leaves. <laughs> God, I wish he'd throw me into that pile of leaves. <laughs> This was most probably because Kevin was shipped out to Iraq and was killed in action. And what ever happened to your son, Kevin? He died in Iraq. Sad. Or was he? Because it's later revealed that he faked his own death, returning in Season 10's Thanksgiving. And after confessing that he went AWOL, everyone turned against him. Well, everyone except for Meg, but Kevin wasn't interested. We don't have to sit here and listen to this. Come on, Kevin, let's get out of here. Nice try, skank. Worth a shot. But they would finally pay off this story in Season 17, Stand By Meg. When Brian and Stewie start to feel bad for Meg, they decide that she really needs some happiness in her life, and so they go out and search for a guy for her. They come across Kevin just as he's preparing to burn himself alive, and therefore they think he's the perfect guy for Meg. So Kevin asks Meg out, and she's super excited to finally be dating her longtime crush. The two go out for dinner, but it just doesn't work out, simply because she realises that he's just too broken inside. He's a psycho. I dumped his ass. You're okay with it? Yeah. It actually felt great to be empowered for once. Good on you, Meg. Also, side note, I do love they made a storyline out of this, which was something that started way back in Season 1. You don't see that too much in Family Guy. So, with Kevin out of the picture, Neil Goldman soon sweeps in, the local dweeb at school who is totally obsessed with Meg. But she was far more interested in moustache news anchor Tom Tucker. 
to the point where she was fantasizing over him. Whoa! <gasps> Yikes! Awkward! So when the news station announces that they're looking for a new intern, Meg has to apply and she's elated when she gets the job, only for Neil to also get a job too. I don't blame Meg for being annoyed because, let's face it, Neil's a creep. Give it to me, Neil! Yeah, that'll work just fine. Ugh. Meg and Neil's first assignment is to report on a hostage situation, but when a sniper starts shooting the helicopter, Meg fears that she'll die without ever having her first kiss. So she kisses Neil right before they are saved at the very last minute. During the news later that day, Neil showed the footage of them kissing live on air, which he then prints on t-shirts and hands them out at school. Meg, I strongly suggest you hold my hand, lest you look like a slut. And look, I get having a crush on someone, but I hate this guy. It gets worse when Lois invites his parents over and everyone acts as though they're an official couple. So to set the record straight, Meg goes live on air and announces to everyone in town that she can't stand Neil. Hear that, Neil? I don't like you and I never will! And when he hears this, he goes to the top of Town Hall and threatens to jump. So Meg rushes over and asks Tom Tucker to save him, but is shocked to find that her hero is really only interested in filming his fall. So it's up to Meg to save Neil herself. She goes on to explain to him that even though she doesn't like him in that way, it doesn't mean that she wants Neil to hurt himself. But Neil just can't take a hint and continues to hit on her non-stop after this. Like in season 4's 8 simple rules for buying my teenage daughter. Neil, you ask me out like once a day and I always give you the same answer. No! In the episode, Meg is so fed up with Neil asking her out that she appears live on Everybody Loves Raymond. Neil Goldman of Quahog, Rhode Island. Leave me alone! I hate you! But he instead pays for a plane to fly over her house. Now, while all of this is going on, Peter's racking up a huge tab at Mort's pharmacy. You know, Neil's dad. And when it's time for him to pay up, he offers his daughter up for compensation instead. Mort agrees and they draft up a contract. Are you out of your mind? You can't sell me, you fat son of a bitch! Whoa! But it turns out that Neil isn't really interested in Meg anymore because he has a new girlfriend and Meg is surprised to find that she's actually jealous. So she tries to make him jealous by pretending to date Tom Tucker's son. I want some babies! My dad lets me shoot at cats! It's here that she realizes she's made a mistake and she wants Neil after all. Maybe someday we'll get married and you can go up on me! Neil, I want to be your girlfriend! What? So now the two are an official item and it looks like they're pretty happy together. At first anyway, because soon Neil starts abusing the signed contracts by making Meg put his jammies on and plow his garden like a workhorse. Naturally, Meg is fed up with being mistreated, but she can't break up with Neil because they have a contract. Thankfully, Brian discovers that there's an escape clause, which is, is that if Neil commits infidelity, then the contract is voided. So her parents help out and Lois dresses up as Mystique and puts on the moves on Neil. This leads on to Meg bursting in, catching them in the act, and so free of the contract. Thankfully, that was the end of Meg and Neil's relationship up until much later on in season 13's Once Bitten. Here, Neil and Chris become close friends and when Neil goes round his house, he offers to help Meg with her homework. Sorry, Chris. Booty calls. Neil and Meg start spending more time together to the point where he asks her out on a date. You know what? I'd like that. It's a date. I guess she must have forgotten about that time where he used her as a literal slave. But anyway, Chris sees this and goes to confront Neil, who admits that he's only really friends with Chris to get to Meg. So he and Meg go to the cinema together and it looks like Neil's dream is finally going to come true. But right before they kiss, she transforms into Chris. Chris? I'm so sorry. What have I done? Ah, oh, crap. And personally, I am so glad the writers gave up on this because I just can't stand Neil. Meg deserves better. So rewind it back to season three and to the episode from Method to Madness, Meg gets her first proper boyfriend, at least one she's not legally contracted to. His name's Jeff and they meet when his nudist family moves into the neighborhood. Is this the biggest thing you've ever seen? Hey, don't get too cocky. I had a big one like that when I was your age. They get on and the next day he asks her out, which is really, really cute. And even though the whole nudist thing isn't a problem for Meg, it is for her parents. You wanna sit down? Wait a second, don't sit down yet. Dad, what are you doing? 
They forbid her to see him and Meg is mad, but they soon realise their mistake and show their support for their relationship and Jeff by inviting him over for a nude family game night. And yes, even though she got a face full of her dad's thrusting pelvis, Meg is grateful for her parents for being so welcoming and accepting. Thanks you guys, that was really cool. I do think the writers originally intended for this nudist family to be reoccurring characters because they did appear a few times after this. But after season four, they basically disappeared. And I'm not really sure if they were planning on keeping Jeff and Meg together, but we never saw them together again after this episode. Which is a shame because they were quite cute together and he was a nice boy. Far better than some of the other boyfriends she'll have anyway. So I spoke earlier about how Meg shared her very first kiss with Walt Goldman in a not very ideal scenario and it somehow turned into some kind of embarrassing public event. Well, the exact same thing can be said for when she lost her virginity in season 4's Don't Make Me Over. So to break it down, basically Meg is feeling really unattractive, so Lois offers to take her out shopping and give her a makeover. They go to the mall and Meg gets some new clothes and dyes her hair blonde. Oh, uh, welcome to the family, sweetheart. Chris, go burn all Meg's old pictures. This total makeover works and she becomes the most popular girl in school. And basically, long story short, she and the family start their own band with her as the lead singer because of her hot new look. They get so popular that they're invited to perform on Saturday Night Live. And while they're backstage, she bumps into none other than Jimmy Fallon. It's great to finally meet you. I'm hosting. Hey, uh, wh why don't you come hang out in my dressing room? So no, the creators really capture Fallon's fake laughing perfectly. And this is before he'd get his own talk show where he became even more unsufferable. Anyway, my thoughts on Jimmy Fallon aside, Meg and him sleep together in his dressing room when it's revealed that it's just the opening sketch of the show. Meg feels used and humiliated, and just so because her first time was shown live on air. And it was with Jimmy Fallon. So Peter goes and finds Fallon and beats the absolute crap out of him. And by the end of the episode, Meg goes back to being her true self. It's too much work being beautiful. <laughs> Not for me, but it's good to have you back, pumpkin. Even in these earlier episodes, she couldn't really catch a break. So in season four, as Brian swings and sing, Meg experiments with women, more specifically her new lab partner, Sarah. They get on straight away and Sarah soon invites Meg to her after school club, but she soon learns that it's a club for lesbians and she does plan to tell them the truth, but after they say they're gonna throw her a party, she soon changes her mind. I'm a super huge mega lesbian. So she and Sarah start dating, and just like with the previous makeover, Meg tries being something she's not just to fit in. Lois can see right through this and encourages Meg to tell them the truth. So later on, Meg goes round to Sarah's house to finally come clean. It was wrong of me to mislead you. I should go. I was hesitant whether or not to include this as Meg didn't really have feelings for Sarah, but they were technically a couple. Saying this, there were plans for Meg to officially come out as gay, as revealed in a 2016 Vulture interview with showrunner Alex Sulkin. But that was eight years ago now, so it seems like that idea was scrapped. So by this point in the show, Meg has only really dated people her own age, but in the episode Deep Throat, she finds love with a much older man. Unlike her previous older crush, Tom Tucker, this relationship was mutual because when Meg now got an internship with Mayor Adam West, they get a little bit too close. And when Brian finds this out, he sees it as the perfect opportunity to write a scandalous piece about it. So to save her from suffering any embarrassment, Adam West breaks up with her. This story could ruin your future and I can't let that happen. Brian finds out about this and feels absolutely awful because he can see that their relationship was actually genuine. And even though he promises not to write the story, Meg and Wes still don't get back together. But maybe that's for the best because although they did try to portray this relationship as a cute one and wholesome, it is still very, very strange. Meg officially doesn't turn 17 until season 5, which means that Meg is 16 here which makes this incredibly, incredibly creepy, especially since West was probably in his mid seventies here and that's just icky. So even though he was very nice towards her and it's common practice for Family Guy to go off the walls in terms of the portrayal of relationships, I just can't get behind this relationship at all. And although they ended things here, we learn much later on that they still occasionally hook up from time to time as seen in season nine's Tease for Two. Meg? Yeah, this still happens sometimes. After Mayor West, Meg would go on to date a more appropriately aged boy called Doug in season 5's Prick Up Your Ears. 
When sex ed is banned in school, the church comes in and teaches the kids all about abstinence. And it's here where Meg and Doug hit it off. He's wrong because he wants to have sex and he's not married! Wow, you're pretty smart. Thanks, my name's Doug. They become a couple and get purity rings. But because they're horny teenagers, they begin to experiment sexually in other creative ways. You kids were doing it in the ear! Lois is a huge advocate of sex ed and safe sex, and she manages to get the ban lifted. Does this mean I'll see you naked? Yeah. Oh boy, I can't wait! I'm sorry Doug dumped you, honey. And poor Meg, that's gotta be traumatizing to know that someone dumped you as soon as they saw you naked. By season 5's Meg's transformation from relatively normal teenage girl into punching bag was complete. So it's not so surprising that she'd eventually fall for anyone who showed her some kind of morsel of decency and affection. Which brings me to the episode, Barely Legal. In it, Meg runs home in tears because nobody wants to go to prom with her, so feeling bad, Brian reluctantly promises to take her. And at first, Brian is a pretty crappy date. He gets drunk just so he can go through the night, but when Connie makes fun of Meg, he stands up for her, leading on to Meg kissing him. The next day, Brian is completely hungover and regrets everything, especially because Meg is already treating him like a boyfriend, which does make sense because she's a young teenage girl with low self-esteem, so it's only natural that kissing Brian would mean that they're a couple. But in reality, that's not the case, and he tries letting her down gently, but Meg doesn't take rejection too well. I love you too, Brian. And you love me. You do love me, Brian. So the next day, she goes full on crazy by baking a pie for Brian that contains her hair. And now it's inside of you. Part of me is inside of you, Brian. And you know what? I can sympathize with Meg to a certain point, but that's just nasty. If I was Brian, I'd get a restraining order immediately. And Brian should have really done just that because Meg's love soon turns into full on obsession. She knocks him out, ties him up and forces him to go on a date with her. And just before it can go any further, her parents luckily burst in to put a stop to it. But Meg is young and confused, believing that she really does love Brian. So Quagmire tells her to stop by his house later on that night and he'll help her out. And when she comes over, it looks like he's just gonna sleep with her. But instead, he actually does give her some really great advice. But you've got all the time in the world and a lot of wonderful experiences ahead of you. And while this is very wholesome, Quagmire and Meg's relationship turns a whole lot freakier a bit later on. But yeah, more on that a bit later. So this is the episode that pinpointed the beginnings of Meg's crazier side, and the writers will really play into this in the following episodes, to the point where she becomes a full-on serial killer. Personally, I really like that she has this off-kilter side to her, because it makes her a whole lot more interesting. So by this point, Meg has dated a dweeb, a nudist, a girl even though she's not a lesbian, a man 60 years her senior, and strikes out with her very own pet dog. But thankfully, she'd finally meet a normal guy in season 6 as Peter's daughter. The episode starts with a storm in Quahog and the Griffin's house gets flooded, but instead of getting his family to safety, Peter forces Meg to dive into the kitchen to grab his beer. But in doing so, she gets her shirt caught and is almost drowned. She's rescued by Peter, who rushes her to hospital and promises that he will start really taking care of his daughter. And when she comes to, she meets a really cute intern doctor called Michael. Well, hello, sleepyhead. I'm Michael. Hi, Michael. I'm Meg. And Peter actually stays true to his word and becomes a protective dad. Which is great, but he becomes too overprotective. Like when Michael comes round to take Meg on a date, Peter forbids it. G -g Guys that age, all I care about is putting their thing in everything. But she ignores her dad and dates him anyway, but maybe she should have listened to Peter after all because she gets pregnant. And when he finds out, Peter goes over to Michael's house to have a little talk with him. You got my Meg pregnant! What? Oh my god! Which then leads on to Michael proposing to her. Meg is so, so happy, but on the day of the wedding, she finds out that she's not actually pregnant. I got my period. Ow. I must have read the test wrong. What am I gonna do? When she meets him at the altar, she tells him everything and unfortunately he immediately runs away. Which sucks, but at least it ends very sweetly for Peter and Meg at least. You gotta know, I was only thinking about your happiness. I know, Dad. And I appreciate it. And it could be really cute and touching if he didn't go back to mistreating her right by the very next episode. 
So after dating a doctor, Meg's next love interest would be a convict in season 8's Dull Meg for Murder. It seems that Meg has been sneaking away to prison to meet a guy called Luke. The reason why Meg feels such a connection to him is because she also feels trapped and isolated. He's all alone in there and I'm all alone out here. In a way, we're both in prison. And when Luke is denied his parole, he breaks out and sneaks over into Meg's house. Brian and Peter catch him, call Joe to arrest him, and as a result of harboring a fugitive, Meg is sentenced to three months in jail. Luke isn't mentioned again after this, and that was basically because he was away just to get Meg into prison, therefore to set up the rest of the episode. And in story, I think the only real reason why Meg was so interested in Luke was because he was in prison and resonated with him being trapped, and as such, I don't really think it would have worked out otherwise. But at least Meg didn't have to be single for long, because only two episodes later, she finds Anthony. Anthony seems like a normal guy. He wasn't a convict, an old guy, but still, the whole town seems to believe that there must be something wrong with him because he's interested in Meg. They even get Dr. Hartman to do some tests on him. He seems to be completely normal. Oh. But after he checked out, he makes a great impression on her parents, particularly Lois, who fantasizes about being with him instead. So as soon as Meg heads out, Lois makes her move, and she would have gone even further with him if Meg didn't walk in on them. Meg is quite rightly pissed off and proceeds to tear Lois down, really showcasing her crazier side. Oh my god! He hangs me from the shower rod with your old bras and then we laugh at you! Now get out of my room! And so yeah, that's the end of their relationship. Lois is a really shitty mother, and worse still, she didn't even apologise. At least Meg would find a far more decent guy in season 10's Amish guy. Here, the Griffin's car breaks down and they find themselves in Amish country. At first, Meg is miserable without electricity until she meets a chap called Eli. If there's anything we can do to make your room more plain, do not be afraid to ask. They really get along and she gives him her iPhone with a playlist of her favourite songs. I made your playlist of songs that I like. But Eli's father arrives and doesn't approve of him talking to outsiders and forbids him to see her. I suggest you stay away from my son, you harlot. Meg tells her family all about this and asks Peter to talk reason with Eli's dad, and he says yes. However, that plan doesn't work and the family are cast out, shortly followed by Eli, who manages to sneak out with them. I could not let you leave without me, Meg. I love you. I love you too. So the Amish declare war on the Griffins, but just before Peter and Eli's dad comes to blows, Eli manages to stop the fight. He makes his father realise that he was wrong, and thus Eli is given the choice whether or not to stay or leave, eventually deciding to stay. You have shown me so many wondrous things that have opened my eyes to the world beyond my home, but this is where I belong. While it was sad that Meg had to say goodbye to him, at least it was nice to see a proper end of one of Meg's relationships for once. Her other ones mostly just disappeared without a trace, with absolutely no resolution. So yes, their relationship all in all was very, very sweet, but the same can't quite be said about her next relationship, three episodes later, in Quagmire and Meg. In it, Meg has turned 18, and as soon as she's legal, Quagmire wastes absolutely no time in preying on her. I talked about this in Quagmire's video, so I won't really dwell on this too much, but yeah, he's creepy, and it's creepy. And yes, it does make sense why Meg would actually like Quagmire, because he's one of few who's actually kind to her. You're such a cutie patootie. If I'm a cutie patootie, then you're a peeny vagini. Aww. And by this point, we've seen enough examples of how impressionable she can be by falling for anyone who shows her at least an ounce of decency. And that's certainly the case when she fell for her other neighbour, Joe Swanson. In the episode The Hand That Rocks the Wheelchair, Bonnie goes out of town and Meg steps in to help Joe while she's gone. And just like Quagmire, Joe is super nice to Meg and treats her decently. I don't mind being seen with you. You don't? Of course not. Wow. But unlike Quagmire, Joe isn't romantically interested in Meg. But of course she starts to fall for him. Yeah. Yeah. That's my boyfriend. And once again, her crazy side starts to appear and she breastfeeds Susie. This feels right, but it tastes like a dirty penny. She also devises a plan to get rid of Bonnie and marry Joe herself. She does this by planting a gun on Bonnie as she goes through airport security. And the second stage of Meg's plan is to get herself disabled so that her and Joe would have something in common. 
and made us the same joke. We're exactly alike, you and I. When Meg is eventually taken to hospital, she comes clean about everything and her true feelings. And Joe, being the great guy he is, lets her down gently. Don't. I'm lucky to have you as a neighbor. And even luckier to have you as a friend. So yeah, basically Meg hasn't had the best luck with Guy so far, but maybe like Cinderella, she just has to face her hardships before she can finally find her prince. Which brings me to Season 10's Lego of My Mego. Here Meg is abducted to be sold to the highest bidder, and naturally Peter doesn't give a single fuck that his only daughter has been taken away, so it's up to Brian and Stewie to go and save her. But it turns out getting taken was the best thing that could have happened to Meg, because she's bought by a kind and handsome prince. He gives her freedom and even asks her to be his wife. Will you be my wife, Princess Meg? Oh yes! Yes! But this happy ending is cut short when Stewie kills him and completely wipes her memory. Stewie? Hi, Meg. So Meg was this close to a happily ever after and it was snatched away. She could have been married to a handsome prince, be treated like an actual princess and be far away from her abusive family. You just can't help but feel bad for the girl. But saying that, although I do feel bad for Meg, I'm not always on her side. She does make some really, really stupid decisions, like the whole Brian situation for one, and one other she made was in season 11's Friends Without Benefits. This is when Meg falls for a jock at her school called Kent. She can't stop thinking about him and she fantasizes about him until she plucks up the courage to ask him out. Maybe you wanted to hang out sometime? Sure. Oh, wow, cool. But while out at the cinema, Ken isn't responding to any of Meg's moves, and she finds out the reason why when he drops her off. I'm gay. You are? Ken admits that he actually likes her brother Chris, but Meg doesn't accept this and thinks that if she tries hard enough, maybe he'll change his mind. Well, I'll help him figure things out. I'll help him figure out that he's straight. She really pushes the narrative that he isn't gay until he says that he can no longer be friends with her. Not to be deterred though, she plans to make Chris and Kent hook up instead. I mean, if I can't have Kent, then that's the next best thing. I've just gotta get Chris to sleep with him. Her sinister plan includes getting Chris all drugged up and having Kent sleep with him, which is insanely fucked up and thankfully she doesn't actually go through with it by the end. I guess I wasn't thinking straight. I'm just glad I stopped before I did a really terrible thing. Sorry Meg, but I can't defend you here mate. That's just wrong. Meg is so desperate for a boyfriend that they could literally steal her organs and she'd still want to date them. And that's exactly what happens in season 11's Valentine's Day in Quahog. Meg thinks she's found a really great guy called Toby, but he's only interested in harvesting her organs to sell on the black market. So he takes her out, drugs her and removes her kidney, but Meg isn't gonna let him off so easily. You promised we'd spend Valentine's Day together, the whole day. And I'm not letting you break that promise. They actually have a really great day. They go ice skating, have dinner, get their caricatures done, and by the end of the day, he even gives her back her kidney. Oh, this has been the best Valentine's Day ever. And instead of going to the hospital to put it back inside of her, she decides to keep it on her shelf as a reminder of that very special day. The fact that this was the best day of her life is incredibly, incredibly sad. No, really, think about it. A guy drugged her, harvested her organ, and this is considered her best Valentine's Day ever? Jesus Christ. So I'm going to quickly run down some other brief relationships Meg's been in. One was with the Count from Sesame Street. Two nipples! Ah, 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 ah! Three nipples! Oh, hell no, I'm out of here. And the other was with Mario. Come with me, Meg, my princess. We're gonna take this relationship to the next level. But the issue with this plumber is that he kept bringing along his brother Luigi. He like him a sloppy second. We are plumber brothers. We are not a high class of people. Meg wouldn't have another love interest until season 18's Yacht Rocky. In it, the Griffins go on a cruise and it's here where she falls for a crew member called Chad. They hang out and by the end of the night, he confesses his love for her. Right at the very same time, a wave crashes into the ship and he's decapitated by an oar. And you'd think this would be the end of their relationship, right? Well, not quite. She actually carries his lifeless body around and even introduces him to her family. We then get this one minute clip of Chris attempting to throw Chad's head up to Meg who proceeds to then attach it to the body. Also, it's very weird that this isn't even the first dead body that she dated. 
My god, Meg needs some therapy quick. A season later, she thankfully goes out with an alive person, the only downside being is that he's gay. In season 19's Meg's wedding, she starts spending more time with her friend and the owner of the bowling alley, Bruce. She falls for him because he actually treats her like a good friend, and as we all know by now, if you show any kindness to Meg, she'll definitely fall in love with you. But as everyone knows, Bruce is gay, and the only people who don't know that are Meg and his parents. So he proposes to Meg to make his family proud and Meg is so excited to marry her best friend. But at the altar, she realises that he's in love with somebody else, so calls it off and encourages Bruce to be his authentic self and to be with the man he truly loves. Bruce and Jeffrey love each other. They deserve to be happy. And so do I. It's a really, really great ending and just shows how much she's really grown since the season 11 episode when she thought that she could turn a gay guy straight. And whether or not the writers intended to do this, it's still a great bit of character development. Meg and Bruce's friendship is one of those rare instances of canon in Family Guy, and in season 22, she even offers to be their surrogate for Bruce and his husband's baby. In season 20's Hardboiled Meg, she would find a new love interest with a robber called Seymour. She acts as his getaway driver and the two have a passionate love affair, but we find out later on that this man is just a figment of Meg's imagination. He doesn't exist because Meg just created him because she was so, so lonely. It's devastating and I just wonder when will the writers give Meg a break? Her final and most recent boyfriend came in season 21's From Russia With Love. Here, Brian gets hacked and as it turns out, Meg is really quite talented at finding people online. She discovers that the hacker's location is in Russia and offers to come along with Brian and Stewie to help catch him because she can speak Russian. Now, this new skill may seem a bit random, but in a season 16 episode, Meg was actually killed and replaced by a Russian spy. I'm your secret clone. We have been orphan blacked, and you soon will be dead. And I know this was just supposed to be a joke, but I kind of like to think of it as canon. A neat little callback, if you will. Anyway, so Meg joins Brian and Stewie on their trip to Russia, where they meet the hacker Ivan. Meg and Ivan really hear things off, so much so that she decides to stay in Russia. I'm an eight in Russia, Brian. I'm staying here. And surprisingly, this was carried over into the next episode where Meg got married to him. But this isn't their happily ever after because she discovers that he's only using her to get a green card. So she gets his phone to tweet negative things about Putin and as a result, a SWAT team come in and take him down. And although her marriage was a sham and this was yet another failed relationship, I do love that Meg saved herself here. As soon as she found out she was being taken advantage of, she used her own smarts in order to deal with it. And overall, I think that's a really big learning curve for her. We've seen her really mature from her past relationships into actually creating really sweet and genuine friendships with Bruce, as well as also saving herself from more heartbreak. In these recent episodes, she doesn't really come across as completely helpless. She's got choices and she makes the right ones. And for me, that's kind of what I want from Meg. And so that's the end of her relationship so far in the show. And unlike Brian's dating video where I could pinpoint Gillian to being the true love of his life or Cheryl Teague's being quagmires, I can't really do the same for Meg. Her only slightly reoccurring love interest is Adam West, but barely, and the only other one who could have worked was probably that Amish kid, maybe, but I still feel like they didn't really flesh out his character enough to be an actual relationship. I just wish that in the future, producers will give Meg a proper, proper relationship episode, and one that is treated at least a bit more seriously and not as a joke. You can still have the jokes either side of it, and I'm not saying don't ever have another horrible dating episode, but we've had so many now. Come on, mix it up. I mean, they could give her someone her own age, someone who won't kiss her mom, isn't gay, trigger for a green card, and one that is actually alive. Is that too much to ask? 